plug, I'd like to introduce you all to BJ and Alba. It's my pleasure. BJ is 500's Director of Innovation and Partnerships, focusing in corporate innovation. And Alba is the manager of innovation and partnership is a manager of innovation and partnerships, specifically in startup ecosystem development. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to BJ and Alba, who will explain more about their experience in corporate venture, and then we'll start the webinar. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, or uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're excited to join you today and share our findings from our recent CBC survey and the report uh, that uh, is available uh, online, but we want to take the special opportunity to share here with our, our VCU alumni and family, uh, some of our uh, particular insights and findings and uh, kind of answer your questions uh, to get to know this uh, particular uh, topic. Uh, my name is Vijay Rajendran. I'm responsible for uh, corporate innovation and partnerships here at 500 based in San Francisco and uh, working with our corporate partners that want to see, find and invest in the startup ecosystem. Alba. And my name is Alba Turriaga Cardo, also working with uh, VJ with uh, leading corporates empowering their own innovation initiatives. I'm working also with governments and foundations that want to support the development of their own local startup ecosystem. So pleasure being here today with you all. So we'd love to do a quick poll of who we have in the room. We know there's a number of different folks in the VCU community. Uh, so you may see a little pop-up appear in front of you. And so we'd love to know who we have in the room. Are you a institutional investor, uh, an, an institutional venture capitalist specifically, a corporate venture capital investor, or pro uh, other professional, uh, an angel, an LP of some kind, uh, a corporate innovation uh, pro or a baller shot caller, uh, what we'll, we'll call the other category. Take a moment to enter in your background. And then we'll give it a couple more seconds. Patrick, who do we have in the room? So it looks like we have about 40% are corporate venture capitalists, about 30% are angels themselves as well. And then coming up in third, we have corporate innovators. We have about 15%. And then we always have baller shot callers coming in at about 12%. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. And uh, great to understand the, the background of, of who's in the room. I think what you'll find today will be uh, relevant for uh, certainly the CBC folks, but also uh, for, you know, angels and, uh, and others uh, who are trying to think of, you know, who is downstream uh, from them in terms of the you know capital market, uh, and then certainly for for corporate innovation folks, you know how this important tool uh, plays into the kind of things that you know you're all doing in your organizations. So some legal notices here. Uh, this is not investment advice, uh, and uh, we're not your lawyers. And uh, if you do want to uh, do something exciting after. Uh, after hearing more about this report or uh, are uh, you know excited by what you see here you know get in touch with us and, and we'd love to have a, a conversation uh, offline about uh, what you see here so a quick shout out for our innovation uh, report specifically on CBC uh, those of you who have had a chance to read it know that we break down different types of CBC uh, investors and uh, this is uh, an imp important part of uh, what uh, we think we found from our survey work. Uh, so if you know your CBC type, great. Uh, we'll be coming back to this later in this webinar uh, to talk about you know, uh, their particular characteristics and also get a sense of who uh, people on the call think uh, they are. And, and uh, uh, there'll also be a link later in the port in order to take a test uh, and, that will allow you to determine your CBC type. So background on 500, many of you in the VCU community will know this uh, already. 
but uh, a reminder is, you know, our mission is, of course, to discover and back the world's most talented entrepreneurs, help them create successful companies at scale, and build thriving global ecosystems. And part of that uh, thriving global ecosystem includes, of course, the uh, the corporates that are customers or uh, vendors or investors, certainly uh, in the startups uh, that we back uh, and uh, ones that uh, we also want to see succeed that maybe we don't back. But uh, that ecosystem is, is enabling and, and we are committed to uh, making it better. More about 500 startups. As many of you know, we are very global. Uh, we have folks in about uh, 20 different locations around the world. Uh, many of the prominent ones highlighted here. Uh, in addition, uh, we have over 580 million in committed capital. Uh, that's in more than uh, 2,300 portfolio companies today in over 75 countries uh, that we've all uh, been able to uh, invest in over the last decade or so since our founding. 16 unicorns today in our portfolio and counting. Uh, the prominent ones or ones that we can officially disclose are displayed here, uh, as well as uh, more than 80 centaurs or companies valued between 100 million and a billion dollars right now. Asterix here for uh, our exits, uh, either through IPO or acquisition. What's behind all of that? An investment thesis where 500 invest early and invest often. Uh, so 500 has proven a method to do early stage investing in this global context, of course, which focuses on being helpful to founders. This isn't founder friendly, it's founder first, uh, which is an important uh, treatise of ours and how to build meaningful relationships in that global ecosystem so that when they go out in the world, uh, there's uh, a way in which they can be successful. Now, we recognize that corporates in particular are usually investing well after that stage that 500 usually gets involved. We're usually the first institutional check. And so uh, the research that you'll see reflected here is, is mindful of that later in stage of investment. How do we see this set up? Well, our approach to open innovation is certainly one where 500 sits uh, in uh, the middle and, and we're very fortunate to sit in the middle of an of important worlds, so the corporate world and the startup world. But increasingly, these are getting closer together. And that's because each has something very valuable to offer to the other. And so uh, from our current open innovation partnerships, all the way to the types of strategic investors we have, we know that corporations get access to rapid innovation, new business models and technology, as well as talent from startups. And alternatively, in addition to capital, which certainly is part of the, uh, the, the topic that we're gonna cover today, there are very valuable uh, additions in terms of distribution and scaling, a, testing environment or other things that are strategic in nature that corporations can offer to startups. What are some of the tools of innovation? As some of you will know from our past reports, we know that there's a toolkit of things that people should use and great practitioners of uh, corporate innovation are uh, agile at figuring out how to use different tools to get different outcomes or in different contexts or even better how to use certain tools in combination. So while you could do M&A, you can have pilots, you can have events, build accelerators, offer co-working. What we're gonna talk about today is specifically investment. That doesn't mean the other things aren't important. That doesn't mean we're going to present to what we think is any kind of silver bullet, but we're going to really index on this important and emerging phenomenon today of corporate venture capital. So, Recently, we surveyed over a hundred corporate venture capital units across every major industry and geographic location. We gained a number of insights into the pain points they face on a daily basis and also synthesized uh, the profiles that I alluded to before. Uh, but let's start off with a synopsis of what we learned. Alva. Okay. Thank you so much, BJ. Um, so what we saw before going into this research was that um, corporate venture capital can be quite an opaque industry. And so we went out and spoke to over 100 different CVC units in 35 countries, 
five continents. And today I wanted to share some of the places in which these units are struggling and some of the ways in which they could improve. So first of all, what we've seen is that over the last decade, corporate venture capital has become increasingly important, both in number of deals as well as the overall deal value. They've both steadily increased. Today, we see around 23% of all venture deals having some sort of corporate participation. What we found was that corporate venture capital can take many shapes and forms, and there's many different paths. Seven particularly that we identified uh, that are mostly followed by CVC units. And each of these different paths have some trade-offs and decisions to make. Um, so we wanted to share some of those. What we saw was that most popular by far when uh, a corporate venture unit is beginning its activities, um, they usually tend to start by doing um, balance sheet investments. Over 50% of respondents uh, shared that they began this way making ad hoc deals directly off the balance sheet. However, as these units mature, explore, learn, um, they tend to see like other forms of venture investment. Some of them uh, create their own dedicated internal fund within the parent organization, either having discrete amount of funding or a recurring amount of funding, either annually or an evergreen fund. We also saw some of the units actually making uh, indirect investment into startups by becoming LPs uh, to other venture capital funds, um, either to unlock a new geography in which they don't directly have a presence or to get additional deal flow, particularly when they're, um, the VCs are investing in earlier stages than themselves are investing, or just to learn the best practices on venture investment from the hands of someone with more experience. And lastly, we also saw that some units were deciding to create a full independent legal entity from the parent organization and either they themselves becoming the single LP to the fund or seeking uh, external fundraising. Aside from this, something that we wanted to share uh, was also what are uh, some of the most common challenges that are experienced regardless of what path is taking to venture investment. So we've recognized five most common trap and pitfalls uh, here outlined. Uh, the first and most important uh, shared by our respondents what that, was that many of the CVC units are uh, experiencing a difficulty in securing um, a timely internal approval for their investments. Some of them report that uh, it's a lack of clear decision-making structure or body, uh, or the fact that they have five different bodies that need to have a consensus decision before they commit uh, an investment. Whereas other teams reported that actually they need marketing approval before committing to making an investment. Um, so all of these uh, things make CVC units take a much longer time um, by even several months to make an investment decision than their VC counterparts. This is the number one challenge. The second uh, most common challenge that we saw was actually um, that CVC units often struggle to evaluate the strategic returns of their investments to their uh, parent organization. So what we've seen is that strategy always requires uh, a certain degree of uncertainty you're making some assumptions, you have certain objectives, and this can be either more or less defined by the strategic organization. Um, but the CVC units, even if they themselves are considered the strategic investment arm, they often have no clear measurement on what is uh, actually a strategic return, making it very difficult for them to evaluate uh, the performance of their fund. And to us, it seems counterintuitive in that uh, for these multi-billion dollar corporations, uh, the impact that their investments can have to the bottom line of the parent organization and the parent business can be much more significant than a return on investment of their fund um, that has like a, a limited amount of size. So as VJ will later share, um, one of the, the things that we propose in the report is aside from measuring the return on investment of a corporate venture capital fund, uh, for our corporate audience to also measure the return on innovation. And we propose some metrics around this. Uh, the third most common challenge is actually uh, running timely uh, pilots and proof of concept projects uh, with the, the investments and the startups that they are collaborating with. 
Um, so normally uh, our respondents uh, and the startups that we are in touch with consider um, corporate venture capital as strategic capital. Uh, and so often uh, startups that are wanting to be involved with a the corporate, there seem to there needs to be like some form of uh, project together with the parent organization. However, CVC units um, like struggle to coordinate and internally orchestrate uh, their own corporate structures because often there is no clear process to run these projects. There's no clear decision making structure. And so CVC units struggle to, to run these projects effectively. Uh, fourth um, challenge experienced by our respondents, they, they shared that they really struggle in maintaining a, the long-term commitment to the investment activities uh, from the parent organization. We identified that the mandates in the CVC sector are short, actually very short, uh, as little as just four years. Uh, when traditional uh, VCs tend to span over a decade. And uh, uh, juxtaposition, so when you consider that it is very difficult to measure the strategic returns, but you have such a short mandate, uh, this means that some of the units we are now seeing that are being shut down before having a fair chance to showing the, the strategic value to the current organization. And the last, um, the last point in which our CVC respondents share that they struggle is providing actually useful support to their, uh, their investment companies. What we see today in the market is that there's a relative abundance of capital. And so when a startup is considering uh, receiving a corporate venture capital investment, they often perceive it as a strategic money. So getting capital plus certain strategic incentives. Uh, but what is it that startups... Um, we went out and asked uh, some startups, uh, what are they looking for when working with corporates? And these are some of the, the insights that we got. They're looking for uh, networks, knowledge, R&D support, um, accountant support, investment dollars, but also um, additional strategic uh, insights. But what we saw is that actually the three top things above all that startups are looking for are first the global expansion opportunity that comes from working with a large um, corporate client, uh, allowing for startups to unlock new markets, enter markets with presence. Uh, they're also looking for the deep uh, sales and the distribution expertise that start that corporates can share. Uh, so that startups can scale their product and service offerings. And thirdly, they're looking for sourcing assistance for talent. Uh, startups are high growth companies, and so uh, it's very useful for them to networks to push their um, corporate growth. And while CVC units should try to avoid like these five traps and pitfalls, Necessary. Uh, so we encourage all of our respondents learn and uh, repeat. Hello everyone, just give us a few moments to, to reconnect and we'll be right back.
Hello, are we here? Yes. I have the Chrome. Okay, are we on? Yes. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. It looks like we had a Zoom disconnect. Uh, let's continue. So, uh, as I was saying, there are three key dimensions that matter in terms of like how you can set up your CVC unit for success. So the first is, are you strategic versus financial? So specifically your priorities uh, in terms of what you're, you're trying to do. And then secondly, are you corporate versus entrepreneurial? This is cultural, this is about the team and like who you have doing this kind of important work. And the third is about org design and that is autonomous versus integrated. You know, are you, you know, very close or um, are you not to the parent organization? So the first question is, you know, what returns matter to your, your parent? And we'll get into what this means. There is a spectrum of returns in terms of being more strategic or more financial. On one extreme, the folks that are highly strategic, their primary goal is to maximize any strategic gains and financial returns are only measured indirectly. So for them, investing is a tool. It augments uh, the business unit and corporate development activity. And they're very explicit about that. And then you have folks who are more strategic as opposed to being totally strategic. And for them, their primary goal is to maximize the strategic gains again, and the financial returns are actually measured indirectly and indirectly. So they do like actually uh, care what the uh, financial returns might look like. And in that case, corporate venture units include a minimum re uh, requirement on financial returns. Uh, and uh, they may be you know, an evergreen fund or required to finance themselves at some point in time. And then there's like some folks who are 50-50, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but then you have folks that are more financial. So their primary goal is to maximize financial returns and strategic gains are me measured both indirectly and directly. Uh, and those corporate venture units include some minimum requirement on strategic gains. So that can differ from what matters to business units or high level corporate strategy. Uh, but these are trying to maximize financial returns on investment in some pre-selected technologies or uh, some particular verticals that have been defined as strategic to the organization or somehow you know, close to particular business units. And then finally, there's the financial uh, you know, totally financial, you know, returns spectrum uh, extreme. And here, the primary goal is to maximize financial returns and strategic gains are only measured indirectly. So for these folks, investing is a revenue stream and there's an expectation of, you know, future uh, income that will accrue to the, the company uh, and it can augment uh, business unit and corporate development activity. So, uh, in the, the first case, you know, it does augment business unit and corporate development activity from a strategic standpoint. In the, um, in the last case, it is all about how do you like actually uh, augment it uh, with uh, you know, actual uh, financial outcomes. The 50-50. So folks that describe themselves as 50-50 responded with the most uh, disappointment in terms of achieving either their strategic or financial goals. Mm -hmm. uh, we often hear the, the common trope among uh, the CBC community of it's not strategic to lose money or something like that. Uh, it turns out though, if you uh, don't lean in one direction or another, uh, it sets one up for, dis for disappointment in either direction. The third dimension here, corporate versus entrepreneurial. So again, this has to do with whether it's a, a culture of investors uh, in the CBC unit who come from the startup ecosystem or more from the uh, corporate background. So what, the way we see this in the culture spectrum is the corporate folks tend to be much more top down. That is to say that decision-making tends to be more hierarchical and system, systemic in, uh, in nature. So that means that the leadership, the compensation, the team composition all flow down from the parent organization. The entrepreneurial uh, end of the spectrum is what you could call more bottom-up. 
And that tends to be totally like flat, quite trial and error based uh, decision making, uh, looking at what is out there in, in the wild uh, and drawing uh, some uh, conclusions about what to try and what to do. The leadership, the compensation, the team compensation, composition there uh, tend to be more reflective of what you would see in a traditional financially uh, oriented uh, VC firm uh, and less uh, it aligned to how comp and other dynamics might uh, be uh, in the, the parent comp uh, corporation. So big differences that tend to flow out of being one way or another in the culture spectrum. The final aspect here is to be autonomous versus integrated. So this is a little bit different from culture. This is about org design, and this is what will be the relationship with the parent. So on this spectrum, we found folks that were highly autonomous all the way to highly integrated. The autonomous units prioritize quick and seamless procedures. The entity structure, the approval process, the resources are built from the beginning or quickly adapted to enable that unit to be self-sustainable and to take care of itself without having to uh, get too many uh, approvals and multiple uh, decision points from different committees and, uh, and so on inside of the, the organization. We found this autonomy is highly prevalent in financial units. So there's some correlation here. On the integrated front, now these units prioritize alignment and access to resources. Because they really are trying to draw on the strategic value of the, the parent, the entity structure they pick, the approval processes, the sign-offs, the resources that they want to leverage are actually built in to maximize those units' impact. Uh, and not everyone is at that uh, level of integration, but that's what we found at one extreme. And certainly those types of folks are highly correlated with being strategic. So our findings revealed a set of what we call CVC types, two of which stood out from the pack. The first of those two is what we called the hunter. The hunter operates as a financially driven investor. It has an entrepreneurial culture and tends to be fairly integrated. The second of the two that really stood out in terms of reporting their greatest success uh, was strategic units on a great, uh, that we call explorers. And they're sort of like on a great quest to find a legendary unicorn. They have a very top-down mandate uh, but uh, they, unlike the, the hunter, they tend to be quite corporate in their background. And uh, as we said, is, is correlated earlier, they are highly integrated. So our findings revealed a set of CBC types uh, that go far beyond the hunters and explorers. In addition, we also had the outsiders uh, so those tend to be new arrivals with little connection to the ecosystem. Sometimes they had few resources internally. We have tourists. They are also newcomers to the startup scene with very thesis-driven approaches and focus on fact-finding. Prospectors, uh, which were units with an intuitive sense of the terrain and how to find the best startups. Uh, VC natives, which are their career VCs, you might say. Uh, another group we called scouts. Those are independent units. Uh, we're kind of seeking their fortune using simple tools to find some gems. And then finally, survivalists, which are units that operate like special forces. They have a sense of mission, but total flexibility in terms of how to get there. And depending on these three spectrums and where people fall, these are the different permutations that we found. So we'd love to, create, to conduct a quick poll based on who people think they are in relation to what we just heard. And also if you've taken the, the, the quiz that we have online, who do you think you are? A hunter, an explorer, an outsider, a tourist, a prospector, VC native, scout or survivalist? So we'll give folks a minute uh, to think about it if they haven't taken the quiz so far. Uh, certainly folks who are 
uh, not in corporate context uh, may find themselves in naturally drawn to the, the VC native designation, but we'd love to get a sense of who you think you are based on the type. And again, this is less about you as an individual and more of your, your org, your, your, your unit or your team. All right, so we'll give it a few more seconds. Patrick, who do we have in the room? So it looks like the majority of folks actually kind of close. So explorers are number one with about 27%. Then we have prospectors at about 18, hunters at 15. And then we have kind of a tie between outsiders, VC natives and scouts. And then following up at the end, we have tourists and survivalists with about 6% each. Very interesting. Thanks everyone for, for taking a moment and uh, thinking about that for yourselves. What we wanna share with our research is the distribution from our survey of 100 units. And we found that scouts were the most prevalent group. Uh, and, you know, scouts were, there are a lot of scouts followed by hunters and then explorers. So we have an unusual number of explorers, for example, uh, on this webinar today. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see this distribution. Uh, the, the important thing is that these can change over time because these are decisions that we make in terms of how we work and who we work with uh, that we can adapt and evolve over time to get the kinds of outcomes and results uh, that we'd like to shoot for. So with that, um, I'd like to you know, wrap up with five key lessons for folks to take away. Because while this is like awesome to, to think about these dimensions and the levers we can pull, uh, it's, it's important to know what we can do about it. So the first is prioritize financial or strategic returns and design the CBC unit accordingly. Uh, it is remarkable how uh, seldom this, this can be done in the real world, as much as we know this is common sense. Second, uh, accelerate your team by speeding up to maximize your rate of learning. What we mean by that is, you know, just learning by doing is not enough. Uh, you've got to develop partnerships with others that can make you a better investor faster, minimize uh, the time that it takes to ramp up and uh, establish deal flow and things like that. Third, provide smart and strategic capital. The days of saying that, you know, Sand Hill Road is smart money and CBC is dumb money, those, those are long gone. Today, we want to uh, think about how you can combine those things uh, and offer not just, of course, capital, but scaling capacity and things like that so that you can get into the top deals. Fourth, uh, measure that return on innovation that Alba describes, not just the return on investment. We have some specific ideas about that. Uh, we can discuss in Q&A if people are interested, and, and also we've enumerated some of them in the report. Fifth, integrate those investment activities into a wider corporate innovation framework. So this goes back to our Swiss Army knife that we described before. Like this is something that can't be necessarily done in isolation. The degree of integration you create achieves better both financial and strategic outcomes. So how does this all fit together? You know, we really see a, a build out of a process that means you can't skip the key steps in terms of getting started. For those that are getting started, it begins with thinking about training and development and an investment thesis for your group and also wider corporate stakeholders. So train that train team really well in terms of venture investing, developing investment thesis, it's being uh, built on deep knowledge of current and future trends. Certainly we're big proponents of that and education, uh, is, which is why we're doing this uh, webinar and, and why we have our uh, educational uh, team uh, at 500 Startups operating great programs such as Venture Capital Unlocked in New York. Second, recruitment. 
So thinking about who needs to be on the bus here, uh, an investment team that can be a general partner to run the CVC can be other folks that bring different skill sets uh, to establish the right group. Third, that structuring and mandate definition. It's remarkable how many people get started in CVC as an extension of some strategy or corp dev activity, but without actually like defining a mandate for the CVC function. Fourth, uh, launching a fund in uh, the right way and, and uh, in best practice with press releases and really like kickstarting in, in the right way with a splash to start of investment activities. And then there's ongoing uh, support that um, you may need and that you will need to provide to others, uh, including like deal flow evaluation uh, and co-assessment of investment opportunities with others. And then finally, how are you going to create growth programs for a portfolio uh, so that they can scale up? So again, uh, many people have uh, you know, the opportunity to, to take our quiz. We hope that you'll, uh, you'll try it uh, if you haven't already. Uh, you can also find this in the report at innovation.500.co. Uh, and um, I think we will go now to some questions. I believe some are already coming into the hopper. Um, they are indeed. Just another quick overview of how to do the questions. Make sure that you put them in the Q&A function, not the chat function. They're both at the bottom of the screen. I will be moderating them. You might not be able to get to all of them, but we will share contact information should you wish to follow up. And now to dive right in. So the first question we have is from Jules about any thoughts on the structure that is most common, most effective investments off of balance sheet structure or separate independent funds? Uh, yeah, so we did survey people uh, in terms of the types of investments they were making. Uh, investments off the balance sheet are extremely common. Uh, and in and specifically, like that's a, a, a way for a direct investment to get started. Uh, a separate fund makes sense under certain circumstances off the bat, where perhaps there are uh, regulatory prohibitions from, you know, people being in a particular uh, industry or um, for, from making direct investments uh, because uh, of uh, some some outside requirement. However, uh, what we found is that over time, as programs got bigger, as folks wanted to kind of, uh, you know, kind of ring fence it, uh, that of course, uh, separate funds and entities uh, get established. Uh, so it's, it has to do often with maturity and, and scale which things are. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the, the corporate culture in terms of whether or not uh, one can do something off the balance sheet. Great. And next one is from Carla. How can uh, they measure return on innovation? What kind of metrics are good to use? Yeah, thank you, Carla. Um, in our report, we, we proposed like three different dimensions uh, to measure the return on innovation to the parent organization. These are uh, the gains that are being achieved through venture investment, what are the savings being achieved, as well as what are the learnings and exploration. Uh, so just to give you some ideas on some metrics for each of these categories, uh, in terms of gains, we're looking at uh, how much growth um, is being provided to the existing business lines uh, through this new investment into a startup, uh, how many customers are being gained, how much revenue is generated, what new markets uh, are entered, or what are some of the reputational gains by being uh, perceived as innovative. Uh, in terms of savings to the parent organization, we're looking at what are some of the strategic challenges that are being solved through working with startups and like what do these mean in terms of like savings to the parent organization, in terms of either cost, time, or some of the pitfalls avoided. Um, and the third dimension, like the learning and exploration, we're looking at, for example, like how many deals are you seeing and thus how what type of like consumer trends are you extracting what consumer or customer insights are you identifying uh, what new technology trends are you detecting or what new candidates for example for m a are you evaluating 
Um, so all of these uh, sort of like three dimensions and different metrics can be used to show to the parent organization, not just the return on investment of your fund, but also the uh, more strategic return on innovation that we call it. Excellent. So these are some kind of specific questions, but I think they're important. So how should a CBC be structured in a verticalized corporate? So how, how would you recommend for them to do so? How should a CBC be structured? There are many flavors of this. Uh, I guess verticalized corporate, uh, I'm going to take that to mean a, a company in one particular in a particular industry so, yeah like health for example sure uh, so structure so structuring the the CBC it, again this has to do with you know the kind of returns you're prioritizing if you're prioritizing returns that are uh, highly uh, let's say strategic uh, because you know if you want it to align to that vertical you probably still want to create a specific unit uh, that is a subsidiary in which uh, that uh, capital can be deployed. And um, a, like whether or not there is a, a fund uh, that you can like set aside and deploy capital has to do with probably how ready you are. For a lot of folks to get started, we found that you know, making some initial LP commitments as well as into perhaps some relevant uh, you know, third party funds to generate deal flow as well as just kind of like learn first at the same time that you start writing your, your first few checks uh, off of a, a, the balance sheet was, was totally fine. And then uh, creating a, a separate fund uh, can, can come when you want to align the, the comp and incentives for uh, that management team. However, again, in a strategic context, that may not be uh, the the ideal uh, configuration. Uh, so, uh, you know, by verticalized, I'm going to assume in this case that strategic is is important. Uh, it it may not be, uh, but thinking about that uh, org design all the way down to uh, company incentives is probably the inflection point that we would recommend people to think about. Fantastic. And this one is from Jules. Uh, do you have any info on platform teams within CBCs? Do they just have teams dedicated to partnerships, integration within corporate talent, et cetera? What are your viewpoints on platform teams? Yeah, we saw a lot of people who are doing some sort of digital BD, uh, and that's become increasingly important. The number of uh, folks engaged in that activity has grown uh, con considerably, and that's uh, key if you are going to uh, ask people to, to play a role with regard to uh, forming uh, partnerships and POCs. If you just toss it over the, the fence to a business unit, I think everyone on this uh, call is had some experience in terms of how that might uh, go. So someone who's going to be both the translator and the handholder and, um, and, and kind of uh, uh, you know, coach to uh, startups and internal teams matters a lot. Sometimes it's, it's possible to find some of those folks uh, on the outside, bring them in as um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and residents, different kind of forms of that we, we've seen signs of but uh, it's definitely key that your platform be just really good at that integration aspect as much as it, it needs to uh, you know, run events or uh, represent your brand as a CBC investor. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and uh, just to add one more point to that, uh, what we saw was that the most effective uh, CBC units were uh, using their investments activities as just one more tool in the toolkit for innovation. And so the teams that were able to coordinate with uh, other innovation teams, be it their own accelerator or innovation like spin out team, uh, the, the business units running pilots and POCs, uh, those that have uh, the internal labs or their MA team. If those units, the, those corporates are able to integrate all of these activities were the most su successful in continuously innovating.
Fantastic. So this is kind of a macro perspective question. Uh, do you think now is a good time to start a CVC? Several articles are indicating that there's a glimpse of a recession and there's too much high value of startups. So what would you say to that? Well, that's a great question around timing. So obviously the theory is that you, you invest in startups, you're in investing in companies over many, many years and you're going to want to uh, take a, a long-term view. Uh, then, you know, can you juxtapose that in terms of like, should we be investing in startups that have like crazy high valuations knowing that, you know, uh, a recession is, is coming? Uh, I think the, the, it has a lot to do with what is being prioritized. So if you're in an industry that's going through some kind of like huge shift as is happening in fintech, in mobility, in uh, you know, a number of, of key industries, uh, healthcare and others, then those shifts are gonna play out over a decade uh, and will be far longer than you know, um, 12 or 18 months of, uh, of, of let's say flatline uh, GDP expansion. Uh, that, that's fine. So uh, considering that and the, the long-term bets that the company needs to make, I think that's, that's a good thing. If, you, uh, if we can use the recession to get started as the, the question asks and start investing at, uh, at more attractive valuations, uh, then, then certainly there is a financial case for being um, prudent and, and looking at uh, how to, to jump in to own a bigger piece of uh, startups that uh, will be still uh, building valuable products and may be uh, available in the future at, at better valuation. So uh, it's, it's one of these like things that, that suggests um, there are, of course, some, some risks involved, but hopefully we're playing a longer term game uh, than, than just the next you know, year or two. Great. I'm going to read into a question from, from Chris a little bit, who's asking how to approach CVCs to be LPs in their fund. So as corporates, how do you decide whether you're going to be an LP in a fund or if you're going to open up your own venture fund? What would be the best methodology of making that decision or both or one or the other? Yeah. So there are some companies that have decided from a uh, corporate governance and policies perspective that they will not direct invest in startups, they're not good at it, uh, or they, that's uh, not uh, an, a capability that they, they want to develop, uh, or they're happy to be hands off and, um, and, and things like that. So that's certainly like one foregone conclusion in which case they might be investing. However, there are folks that do invest in, um, in, in a direct way that recognize for key technologies or for key geographic markets, they want to invest in funds in order to uh, gain access uh, to those. Uh, something I saw in uh, my own corporate experience, uh, as well as something uh, that certainly uh, we've observed at, at 500 uh, from our own LP base. Uh, and so I think those are the, the key dimensions. Is it a is it technology? Is it a, a product uh, or, or a, a geography that is not close to our, our, our footprint and our ability to integrate strategically, in which case we would want to make a, a financial um, commitment to uh, an, uh, an outside fund uh, because that gives us exposure and learning uh, that we, we wouldn't be able to uh, spin up as quickly ourselves. Great, now kind of back to structuring a CDC. When you're determining team size, what are important things to keep in mind? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we actually saw that most CVC units have a pretty lean team. Um, over 88% uh, of our respondents had teams that ranged from one to 10 employees. 9% uh, had more than 11 and 3% have more than 20. 
Um, so similarly to uh, like traditional venture capital, we see that uh, the team size is fairly limited. Um, we also saw uh, and got some information about like, the team composition and the prior careers. So I think that's also quite interesting to know uh, who to hire to run these projects. We saw uh, people coming from different backgrounds, including uh, prior entrepreneurs, uh, investment bankers, ex-VCs, ex-management consultants, some corporate employees being um, then taking these activities, uh, some prior CVCs, but actually these only made around 6% of uh, team people having that experience and some just new hires uh, like post-college students. Uh, so more definition on like um, team size and team composition can be found uh, on the report if anybody would like to have a look. Great, and this is from Dimitri. Hey, Dimitri, do you know which CVC type provides based on the data from the report? Which CVC type provides the best and fastest strategic returns to the mother company? Same question for the best financial returns. Go ahead, Alice. Um, so the two personas that VJ highlighted uh, were the two that uh, was shown by the data to be most effective at their uh, at achieving returns for the parent organization. Uh, so the hunter uh, was the one that was able to provide bigger financial returns. Um, this is the the type of CVC unit that prioritizes financial returns over strategic returns. That is pretty entrepreneurial and has like prior experience in uh, has deep connections to the venture world, and that is very integrated with the parent organization. Uh, whereas in terms of uh, strategic returns, what we saw was that the explorer persona uh, was the one that was better positioned to bring strategic value to the parent organization. And just to recap, like this, these units were highly strategic in their approach to uh, measuring returns on their investments. Uh, they had a very corporate driven uh, culture and were very integrated with the parent organization. Um, so what is similar in both uh, types of units is the high integration with uh, the parent company. This allows for units to achieve both financial as well as strategic returns. <clears throat> um, great. So I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to go ahead and close. So uh, is there any thoughts on how to maintain, push a parent organization's long-term commitment to investment activities with an autonomous relations setup? Uh, does that make sense? So in practice, a CBC setup has limited influence on the operation of the parent business unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you are autonomous and, and set up, certainly how you develop that, that LPA, uh, that, um, that LP agreement, uh, matters a, a great deal. So uh, you're going to distribute funds in a few years. You're going to create, I think, hopefully uh, a, a, an important like, uh, event. It can be a CEO summit or thing like that. You bring your portfolio together with uh, your parent company, like, CEO and C-suite and uh, or even board uh, create like moments uh, for uh, for them to like see uh, the value and get inspiration and excited. So even if uh, they're uh, at an arm's length and it may be autonomous uh, and partially or, or not even integrated uh, for whatever like necessary reason, uh, then there's, you know, uh, still some desire to, to continue uh, with that. Uh, the option there is an option, of course, to think about uh, creating an evergreen fund, uh, and that is a uh, a structural advantage for folks that want to remain autonomous and not be requiring um, uh, the parent company to uh, re up for another fund every so often. Uh, so there there are a few, uh, I think, operational decisions as well as uh, you know, architectural decisions uh, with regard to, you know, how you want to, to, uh, to create touch points and excitement as well as the, the basis to just like keep going in an, um, uh, in an automatic way. 
Well, great. We have a ton more questions, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. For those of you that have asked, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar to all registered participants. So if you miss something, feel free to rewatch at your leisure. Again, on your screen, uh, I, you'll, well, before you saw a little bit more information about VCU New York City, which is in partnership with Columbia Venture Community, please check out our website at https colon backslash backslash education.500.co backslash New York and or email me at vcunlocked at 500startups.com. Thanks again so much to VJ and Alba for their time. If you haven't read the CDC report, I definitely recommend getting on that uh, immediately. It's incredibly insightful. And with that, I'll pass it back over to VJ and Alba if you have any final thoughts or words, and then we'll close it up. Thanks everyone for joining us today. This has been a great you know, project for us to lead and to develop. Uh, for you, our, uh, our, our VCU audience and, and the larger ecosystem, uh, we want to keep this conversation going. So shoot us a note at innovation at 500startups.com. Uh, we'd love to, to get your thoughts and ways in, in which we can uh, make sure this uh, is uh, engaging and relevant for all of you. Yeah, thank you all and always open uh, for new connections. Right, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.